Um, I'm Dominique, uh, the founder of Start the Wave, a nonprofit organization focused on empowering, supporting, and uplifting change makers worldwide. Um, we do that by funding positive change in action, amplifying voices, and uh, encouraging growth through education and healing. So we were very excited uh, when Geneva from the Interfaith Center contacted us a little while back um, to hold space for this wonderful conversation. You know, I many queer folks uh, have a complicated relationship with religion. And I think it's important to um, open up dialogue with heart-centered conversation to better understand each other and support the community. So um, we're really, really happy to be here and thank you so much. Uh, I'm so excited to hear all of your beautiful stories and, and, and kick this off. Thank you. Hi everybody, I am Valeria and I'm calling in from Vancouver Island, British Columbia. And I'm, I'm so happy to welcome all of you here uh, to this panel as a, as a representative of URI in North America. URI, the United Religions Initiative, is the world's largest grassroots interfaith organization. We promote enduring daily interfaith cooperation. We try to end religiously motivated violence and we strive to create cultures of peace, justice, and healing for the earth and all living beings. The URI community in North America is made up of tens of thousands of people who've come together across a diversity of beliefs and traditions to work together for justice, equity, and inclusion. And at URI North America, we really believe that diversity is a gift and that pursuing justice means hearing and lifting up every single voice around the table and acknowledging and honoring and uplifting sexual and gender diversity is an integral part of our approach to peace building and interfaith dialogue. I know how challenging and painstaking and hard this work really is and how much still needs to be done. And so I'm so, so thrilled to be with all of you today to have this conversation together. And the commitment of the interfaith movement to moving this conversation forward is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm part of it and part of URI. And I'm so glad to be with all of you today. So on behalf of URI North America, thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Geneva, for uh, making this happen through the Interfaith Center and organizing this. And thank you, Dom, and Start the Way for joining us today and taking the time to be with us. I'm so looking forward to the conversation. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Geneva Blackmer, and I'm the program director for the Interfaith Center at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. And we are so infinitely grateful to start the wave for their willingness to not only have this conversation, but to create space which amplifies the voices of small nonprofits across the country. Our organization's mission is to invite people of diverse religious, spiritual, and secular worldviews to participate in one another's practices in order to cultivate appreciative understanding and build relationships and friendships. We seek to mobilize people of all faiths and no faith around common moral, social, and ethical concerns in order to build the most just and equitable society for all people. Ultimately, we hope to create a safe space to engage our local and global community in dialogue, education, and service. I'm gonna be your moderator today. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Uh, for many of you, this may be the first time you've ever heard the word interfaith which simply means dialogue and cooperation between people of varying religious, spiritual, and secular traditions. Or perhaps this is the first time you've ever heard sexual orientation and gender identity recognized as an intersectional uh, religious or spiritual identity. We hope that conversations like this one hope to normalize the reality that LGBTQIA 2S plus people are not at odds with religion and spirituality, but rather comprise an integral part of these communities. So each one of our panelists today will begin by describing their own journey with faith and spirituality as a member of these communities. Each panelist will have approximately six minutes to respond to that prompt, and then we will open for an audience Q&A. And our student liaison, uh, Priyana Kalita, will be monitoring your questions in the chat. So please feel free to put all of your questions there, and they will be relayed to us. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first panelist. Slats tools pronouns are they, them, and theirs. Slats is a writer, musician, preacher, and theater director and sound designer currently based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Their poetry has been published in numerous journals, the anthology This Present Former Glory, and their own collection, Queering Lent, 
Their work seeks to communicate an honest, raw, clear, and sacred approach to living a life of faith. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to be a part of this really incredible uh, panel of folks. I am so delighted that this conversation is happening in such a vibrant way um, and appreciate the opportunity to share a bit of my story with you. So for pretty much my entire life, um, I've known that I don't fit inside the boxes that I was so often being put into. It's my story is not a story of knowing that I was transgender from a young age or presenting my gender in a way that was drastically different than what was expected of me. I think of my story as more about trying to find the language for how to express how I was feeling and who I was. So I was in fifth grade and I started to realize that I might like both boys and girls, but I actually didn't have the language to describe what that was because I only had the word gay and the word straight and anything in between was not part of what I'd experienced. It wasn't until a friend came out to me as bisexual in middle school that I was like, that's a thing. And I started to feel this freedom that I could identify in this way and didn't have to choose a box uh, for me. Uh, it was also how I always struggled with my given name, which actually literally means girl and how I spent a lot of my adolescence in online spaces back in the early days of the internet, where the internet was not necessarily connected with who you are offline and you could exist kind of anonymously and I could exist without gender. It actually wasn't until I was in graduate school And I started to get the words genderqueer and non-binary and started to realize that there was a space that I could exist and have conversations about gender that actually made sense to me in a way that they hadn't before. Now, the part of my story that is the most surprising for a lot of people is that the first place that I was able to experiment with using they, them pronouns for myself was actually a church camp. So I was raised by two church musicians in the southern part of the United States, which means that I was raised kind of in and around the tradition that still dominates a lot of the national conversation in the U.S. about Christian values and about how being gay, which is usually the words that are being used, is against the will of God. The church that I was raised in was mixed on the issue But my parents and my pastors both affirmed that all of who I was is loved by God and that my identity is not a sin. But even with that really solid affirmation coming to me from a very young age, I've had to deal with the ways that the church has hurt me particularly in the years where I had to spend so much time defending my rights to even be in the room and be a part of the conversation, while my straight cisgender peers were able to spend their time and energy growing spiritually and developing their relationship with God. But even through all of that, there was something that kept drawing me to spirituality and religious practice, specifically within Christianity, even though that has also been a center of so much pain for queer people and even for myself. So I started to study scripture and theology and church history more seriously as a queer person. I went to seminary, I got my master's of divinity degree. And as I was doing that, I started noticing a resonance between my own experience of queerness and what I was finding in Christian tradition. So there is a whole lot of mystery and paradox in our tradition. Uh, Jesus is described as being fully human and fully God at the same time, or God is sometimes described as being one God in three different substances. There's a lot of language of paradox that doesn't quite make sense. And it almost feels like the early church was searching for language to try to describe something that they didn't know how to describe. I mean, how do you describe an infinite God? You have to put this language around it that's going to be imperfect. And it actually felt like I felt when I was trying to find some language to frame my own identity. I've actually found that 
in some places of the church, people are more comfortable with this liminal space that I tend to exist in as a person, because that's our image of who God is. Or like our story of people being created in the image of God. And this image of God encompasses male and female, which must mean that our idea of God includes male and female and beyond gender. And then we've got this story that this God that encompasses all gender is put into a human being in Jesus Christ. And that human being is assigned male at birth. So we've got a being that encompasses all gender going into a body that is assigned one gender, which is in and of itself a transgender experience. But more than anything, I saw throughout scripture, a God that was not aligned with the people who were in power, but with those who were cast out, people who were not allowed in polite society, those who had to create their own families and their own communities, as so many of us have had to do. And that throughout scripture, God was always pushing people towards this wider idea of who should be included. I would even say that God was seeking to queer society, to turn the ups, the expected order upside down so that all of those who didn't fit in boxes or whose box was rejected by the powers that be still had a place to be. The church camp where I ex first experimented with my pronouns was a, a secret queer future pastors camp. In, uh, it was at a time when it still wasn't safe for a lot of us to be fully out in our denomination, our branch of Christianity. And so those of us queer folks looking to become pastors met in secret to support each other. And I was able to experiment with my gender there in a way that I have rarely ever experienced in the secular world. And I think that we were able to create that kind of space in part because that's our tradition. It's a tradition that's comfortable with things that are outside of the norm. It is a tradition that reaches out to those who other folks may not understand. And so my hope is that in this larger conversation, we can begin to move past this idea that Christianity and queerness are incompatible, when I believe they've actually always gone hand in hand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Slats. Our second panelist is Porter. Porter works full-time as an in-house counsel for a software company. And while she wears many hats within Start the Wave, she primarily handles Start the Wave's legal and corporate manners, including partnerships, incorporation, documentation, and overall risk management. Porter's pronouns are she, her, and hers. And she realized her identity as a lesbian when she was a teenager, but unfortunately didn't live an out and proud life until many years later. Even though Porter grew up in a Christian household, learning and practicing Lutheran teachings, coming into her authentic self prompted her to seek her other religious avenues, and she now identifies as spiritual and searching. Hey guys, uh, I wanna start by saying again, thank you Geneva so much for, for organizing all of this. And thank you so much for all of the other speakers um, coming out to tell your stories. I'm already impressed and so excited for, for all of the others. Um, yeah, I think these conversations are so necessary and a lot of them aren't being had. And, and if we had them, we would all just find so many better ways to connect and deepen our understanding of one another. So um, this, this work is so important. So again, thank you. Um, as Geneva said, I identify as a lesbian and um, now am more spiritual, consider myself to be more spiritual rather than religious. Um, I grew up in a very, very small town. Um, we had 1,235 people, uh, graduated with, I think, just over 80 people. You knew everything about everybody. You knew everybody's middle name, everybody's business, probably what they had for lunch, um, everything. And while it was great and everything was familiar and, um, you know, I enjoyed all the, the opportunities I had getting to jump on the snowmobile, go snowboarding, um, dirt biking, all of those little experiences. Um, the unfortunate thing was the grave lack of diversity and, and open-mindedness in an area like that. Um, I also had the fortune of growing up just down the street from my grandparents and spent 
you know, loads of time with them. They, they helped raise me, um, especially my, my grandmother, who I was very close to. Um, so she taught me so many things and she taught me, I mean, she taught me how to shoot a gun. She taught me how to grow veggies. She taught me how to ride horse. She, um, taught me how to, they raise chickens which also led to me not eating chicken for a full year after I watched her butcher said chickens. <laughs> Another story. Um, but she was also a staunch uh, Christian. And I mean that in the sense that I, there are a few times I did not see a Bible in her hand or, or right next to her. Um, she, she would anoint me with oils when I was injured. She would do communion um, for us at, at um, Christian holidays. She never swore. Um, I think her go-to was, oh, sugar. Um, and then beyond that, she even owned a Christian lending library right in town, which was this adorable little library. She had an apartment up top where she would um, lend this space to individuals that were in need, and they didn't even need to pay her, but she just provided that um, for, for anybody. She would do prayer teachings at the jail, um, which was amazing to hear about. And she would talk to me about those individuals. She would nurse animals back to health and um, just to kind of do, she was, she was, she was such a wonderful woman in so many ways. Um, but she really taught me most of the Christian values that I came to know um, outside of my parents. And so we would go to church every Sunday and on Christian holidays, um, I prayed before I ate, I prayed before um, going to bed and um, really just lived. I mean, I lived a Lutheran lifestyle and I didn't, I didn't meet any many other people that weren't Lutherans. Um, there were a few Catholics in town, but, uh, for the most part, it was just that, that religion that I came to know. Um, so I, I say all that to, to make clear that just religion was very ingrained in my life, um, from, from a very young age. And I never thought twice about it. I welcomed Jesus into my heart when at the time I was so young, I literally pictured a little Jesus like coming into the doors right into my heart. And we're, we were hanging out all the time, Jesus and I were. Um, but then as, as I got older and, and realized he's not literally there, um, I still continued all of the other, all of the other um, practices. I still went to church. I still prayed. And um, around the age of 14 is, is when my life started to shift a bit. And I started to think of females in a different way. And I started to realize that I would think, I wonder what it's like to be more friend, more than friends with a female. I wonder what it's like to kiss a female rather than a male. Um, and, and then it immediately hit me based on all of the conversations I had heard around town from my grandparents, from you know ev everybody around me, um, homosexuality was not good. You should not be a homosexual. It is against God's will and God's way. Um, and so then I, I started into my two-year journey of attempting to pray the gay away. Um, I think in that first year, it was more about denial for me. I would pray the gay away every single night. And my prayer was quite similar to my meditation in that I had steps that I would take. I would picture my prayer and it was a white room and I was climbing the steps to hit everything I needed to hit. And if I had forgotten to pray before I went to bed, I would wake up in a panic because I should have prayed. Um, and if I didn't thank enough, but I asked for too much, that would also send me into a bit of an anxiety ridden state. And then I would have to go back and thank, thank more. Um, and so it, it wasn't really a saving grace for me, but rather, um, rather just adding to my fears and my anxieties. So I prayed the gay away for, for that first year. And then um, upon turning 15, I ended up becoming friends with some, some different people that I felt understood me a little bit better. Um, and then around 16 was able to come out to, to one of these friends. And she was actually <laughs> struggling with the same thing, which was great. But rather than she and I dealing with this in a healthy manner, um, because I was already in a depressive state, um, hiding myself and feeling like I didn't belong and dealing with high school all the same and trying to get straight A's and trying to play sports year round um, and just hiding this part of me and dating um, just everything. 
that we decided the best way to deal with this is to just get high and drink all the time. Like, why not? Because when we are high and when we're drunk, we can be ourselves and we're with each other and we can just numb that pain. Um, then it got to the point where we just, there, there was too much of that numbing and um, I, I overstepped and ended up getting arrested. Um, and it kind of reached that like breaking point and it, and got arrested specifically for, uh, um, smoking weed where I, well, not just where I wasn't supposed to, it's illegal in general, but, but got caught because of, of where I was, um, got arrested and got suspended from school. And, um, it was quite shocking. I think for most, um, my, my dad picked me up and uh, I got home and, um, we didn't really talk about it. Like we, he, it just wasn't really approached in a, in a super open manner. And that could have been cause he was just kind of giving me, me space. Also, we've just never dove too deep on the emotional side. Um, and so I got home and I, I put my phone on the counter and, and, and then the next day woke up and started shoveling and shoveling the walk and like cleaning the house, doing all the things. But what terrified me most, like, wasn't the suspension. It wasn't the arrest. It was, I'm going to have to come out. Like, I've, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to deal with this now. And praying the gay away now for two years hasn't helped me. It's not gone anywhere. Um, so after a few days, I had told my, my mom, I need to talk. I need to talk about this a little bit. Um, and we went into my room and she, she um, asked me what's wrong, like what happened. And, and I made her guess because I couldn't say it out loud still at that point. Um, and I remember just the, the build of like, you know, you're just, you're beat red, your heart's now in your throat. And uh, she guessed a ton of things. And then she finally just goes, do you think you're gay? And, and really just like that basically. Um, and I think the way it was said uh, almost hurt harder because it felt so dismissive. Um, and then she, she kind of told me like, this is just a phase. You don't have to worry about it. Everything will be okay. Clearly it wasn't a phase. Um, <laughs> and two years later I was going off to, to college and I was so excited. So I'm like, this is it. I'm going to find my tribe. Like I'm going to live this out and proud lifestyle. I need to get some rainbow stuff. Like we're ready to go. Um, went to college and the same anxieties creeped up. And then I went to, to find, um, other churches. I could finally break out in, and find other churches with maybe youth groups or, or, you know, um, young adult groups that, that I could relate to. And so I specifically looked for churches with, with the rainbow flag outside of them. And I was so pumped and, um, still appreciate that. And I would go to, go to church um, and I would meet other individuals, but unfortunately a lot of them were either much younger than me um, or um, couldn't, couldn't relate in a lot of other ways. And so while we had our religion and we had our, our being part of the community um, in common, I still couldn't seem to find that, that tribe. Um, and so I just kind of continued on. And then um, actually my first winter in college, uh, was my first bout of seasonal depression. So that was fun to deal with. And in Minnesota, seasonal depression lasts from like October to June. And so um, started dealing with that. And then I went home um, that year and got into a conversation with my grandmother. And um, she kept saying very terrible things about the community. And again, felt that rise in my heart all the way to my throat and ended up blurting out to her that I was gay. Um, she told me she was going to grab her oils and anoint me. And I, when she left the room, I left the house. I couldn't, I couldn't face it. I couldn't do it. I was crying and I was going back to college the next day. After that, I found out she had called the rest of the family, um, which is composed of a lot of individuals, like over 30 people on that side, um, including the cousins and whatnot. She had called them all to start a prayer circle for me. Um, and then I had come out to my, my friends. So the whole town knew. So at that point in my life, I had also just lost most of my family. I'd lost my friends, not all of them. Some, of, some people were very supportive and my immediate um, family was very supportive, but had lost everybody else. Um, so then I went back to, to school and took, I had taken a world religions course, which was quite pivotal 
because I learned about so many other open religions and, and ways that um, people can celebrate their spirituality and religion. And um, I apologize. I think I'm probably going over my allotted time. So I'll try to, I'll try to pick this up. Um, so um, after that, I, I had kind of actually gone into an atheist stage and I decided, you know what, I, I'm not going to believe in anything that isn't scientifically proven. And atheism is, is something I can just say, I, I can look at everything and I can explain it scientifically and that's it. Um, but then later in life, I realized I needed something more and that there had to be something more. I feel something more. I feel something more when I look at the moon and I look at the stars and I'm sitting at the beach. I can feel that pull and those energies and those vibrations. Um, and then I just started in on, on the spirituality journey that I've been on where I've been able to connect from a universal standpoint with the earth and with how we are all connected to the earth and how we can all support one another and how we need to stop imposing our will on the earth and instead appreciate her and instead celebrate her and celebrate one another. Um, and so I think at this point in my life, I don't know that it matters what, what your religion is, but just how you, how you, how you celebrate it. And, and, if it brings kindness and if it brings joy, then celebrate that and spread it around. And um, I'm excited to just continue my spirituality journey, but I'm happy that I found it. And I do believe in something just more than myself at this point. Um, I'll stop there. I'm, I'm sorry for running over. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Porter. And thank you for being so vulnerable with us and with the audience that I can tell from the chat that that was very impactful to a lot of people and they appreciated it. So thank you. <laughs> um, so our uh, third panelist <laughs> is uh, Dr. Joshua Pazakowitz, the most venerable Sunyanda. He's a priest, psychotherapist, martial artist, culinarian, and a pathological epistemophiliac. Josh is a Zen Buddhist lineage holder in the Japanese, Korean, and Vietnamese Buddhist traditions, but also holds graduate, graduate academic and ecclesiastical training in a host of religious traditions. He currently serves as the executive director of the Greater Kansas City Interfaith Council and maintains a private practice of spiritually integrative psychotherapy. He may or may not remain involved in religion, chief, chiefly for the brocade fabrics and extravagant hats. And very disappointed he's not wearing an extravagant hat today. But <laughs> Josh, hand it to you. Thanks, Neva. And, and as I did mention before we got formally started here, I did consider the hat, but the limitations of my Zoom reality uh, didn't allow it. So I apologize for the lack of you know brocade that's present. So I want to say that I really appreciate the format of this panel. Um, you know, I've participated in a few this week, and I think it's a fairly difficult task to talk about the intersection of LGBTQIA, et cetera, and spirituality with any sense of authority for a host of reasons, and not the least of which is because both spirituality and the queer experience are defined simply by what they are not. So we're perpetually cast as other, as queer people, and as people experiencing spiritual longings and religious praxis, uh, we're cast as not secular, which is something that's a, a divide present in our society too. So within that infinitely wide array of experience, the only point of authority that I can find to speak from is that of my own experience. And I think it's a wonderful thing that we're doing that, that we're giving sort of live case studies to draw from the psychotherapy vernacular about how we as individuals with unique capacities to process science and religion and metaphor and metaphysical realities are coming together and tackling these things in a real way. And while I've identified with several points of each of the panelists that have been here already, there's also points that I diverge from. And I think that's a really special thing to highlight for each of us. So I remember being a young closeted boy having two career aspirations. Namely, I wanted to run a martial arts studio and, or, and I wanted to be the Pope. So coming from an exceptionally devout Roman Catholic family, I grew up with a holographic portrait of Pope John Paul II taped to the backside of my bedroom door. So if you're over here, he was waving this way. And if you're over here, he was waving this way. And that was just my incessant daily reminder of where I was going on the career ladder. Um, but that was not long lived. So my parents got divorced when I was five or six. I don't remember exactly. And we pretty much were out of the Roman Catholic Church and hierarchy immediately. 
Uh, neither one of my parents felt the need to reconcile to the church. They didn't feel the need to seek an annulment or anything like this. And uh, subsequently, my father came out of the closet as a gay man. So we were left adrift in sort of this world of attending mass frequently. And uh, you know what, visiting my grandmother's house, she had rosaries on every bedpost and a crucifix in every corner. You know, that experience was suddenly gone. But I will say that that early experience of ritual chanting and gestures and incense and bells, and yes, the brocade dresses and jewel and pom-pom flaked ecclesiastical headdress left a permanent mark on my psyche. But how do I arrive in this context? It was interesting that my mom was pretty much devastated by that divorce as sometimes happened. And she was all of a sudden questioning the things that spirituality seeks to address. These big concerns of meaning. Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? And so that sort of underpinned my, my you know, earliest schooling memories. So that lasted from, like I said, the age of five or six to about fourth grade. And my dad still took us to church as kind of Christmas and Easter, like he felt there was an important aspect to uh, spirituality to remain in touch with, but not to be super serious about. He was struggling with his own queer identity and, and place in the world of spirituality. Uh, and this was at a time when, you know, this was just completely unacceptable to talk about. You know, I remember uh, he had a roommate that I later found out was a long-term romantic partner who had a, a big place in my, my life. Um, but when we would go out in public, and even especially to church, you know, we had to sit separately. We didn't sit in the same pew or in the same row. And you staggered going into restaurants because you didn't want anybody to, to question what was going on. It was physically not safe in our part of the world. So I remember around fourth grade, uh, we had a knock at the door. My maternal great grandmother, who was kind of the matriarch of our family, died. And uh, everybody was kind of mourning that, but again, not being in this Catholic religious milieu that we were all sort of raised and formed within, we didn't have a lot of resources to lean on. And so on the other side of that knock at the door were a pair of Jehovah's Witnesses. And so all of, I will say now, the karmic conditions aligned perfectly for my mom to invite them in. And so very shortly thereafter, we were attending church or meetings, as the Jehovah's Witnesses say, upwards of five times a week at the local kingdom hall. And I say local, we had to drive like 45 minutes to get to the kingdom hall. We lived in very, very rural uh, South Missouri. Uh, that was an interesting experience. Um, you know, I, I don't remember the exact age when sort of sexuality became a concern of mine, but it was something even not knowing the details of my dad's life, because that was kept from us for a time too. Um, it was just kind of unquestioned that I enjoyed male company, I guess. I enjoyed being around men in a way that not everybody else did at that age. But, you know, it was something that I was cognizant of, but didn't have a vernacular to describe. But it was nothing that I had to rally against or struggle with because we didn't talk about this sort of thing. Um, fast forward being in the Jehovah's Witness congregation. This is all we talked about for some reason at that point. There was at least one sermon a week speaking about the depravity of humanity expressed in the homosexual queer culture and agenda that has taken over popular media, et cetera. So um, that was interesting for me because on one half, I was deeply, deeply attracted to religious praxis and, and all things that were involved in that. Those big questions were meaningful for me still. Um, but on the other side, the answers I was being given were questionable. And I think if it weren't for that early understanding of my sexual orientation, if I could have called it that, being slightly different, I would have adopted that fully and probably been in a very different place in time uh, right now. So I, I had this struggle, as many of us do, that says, hey, this whole religious tradition seemingly is standing in opposition to something that's fundamental about myself. And yet I find myself truly divided in two camps, not knowing exactly where to turn because both of those interests as I developed into an adolescent, those big questions and obviously these romantic concerns as a teenager uh, were, were significant in my life. And so I grew up, uh, continued in that process until my dad had had enough. And I think he had enough when my little brother came and gave him a lecture about why homosexual people were not going to live forever with their families as everybody else was in paradise restored on earth. And so he immediately looks up a local church, which was the only open and affirming LGBT inclusive congregation in our city at that time, and begins taking us as an agnostic himself by that point to church. And I'll never forget him saying, what your mom is doing, that cannot be your only experience of Christianity. 
And I'm forever appreciative of that because I really didn't know there was another way to approach scripture and Holy Writ. The Jehovah's Witnesses had a really good wrapped up pretty even way to, to deal with that and present it as authoritative. So all of a sudden I'm sitting in a congregation with transgendered people and with LGBTQ families and straight people and young people and old people. And that was really important. And still, by the time I was an adult, I'd had enough of the conflicting Christian message and ethos and left it entirely. Um, so I had discovered Buddhism by way of martial arts as a young kid. Uh, and that was an interest that I secretly kept up throughout all of my upbringing. Um, I had a Buddhist teacher in Kansas City when I would visit my dad on the weekend that would give me this literature and books and I would take it home, hidden in my weekend bag and hide it under my uh, bed, <laughs> you know, so I could read it and it wouldn't be discovered. And there was a big incident of my mom finding it, raiding my room one day at school. And, you know, that was a problem, but <laughs> it was a colorful upbringing. So long story short, I find myself hopping around Buddhist monasteries um, throughout the world and being trained as a Buddhist cleric and eventually leading some congregations. And while it was a respite in the sense that Buddhism didn't have as much to say or to be concerned about sexual orientation as an ontological sin or, or a reality that damns you to, to some punishment forever in its worst forms even, it also wasn't deeply affirming of that aspect. So it's kind of ambivalent, right? And in fact, training in Asia rather than the Western, you know, sort of commodified version of, of Buddhism, uh, there are some things that come up in a cultural background that that question the reality of, of where do we fit within the Buddhist uh, ecclesiastical structure as people who are maybe not clearly male or female or mix that up on the other end by who we're romantically involved with or interested in. And then of course, as sexuality itself is repressed in the tradition that I still walk within. So, you know, there, there are not clear, easy lines to draw that this is better than that. And that experience has reintroduced me. And I went back to seminary and got a Christian seminary degree to having a new appreciation for how things can be. And so sexual orientation as an experience has given me sort of an epistemological and uh, interpretive framework to wrestle with the big questions that all religions still have. And I think a fairly unique way, because I'm able to question things from a fundamental level based on experience that might have been forbidden or inaccessible to me, if not for this LGBTQ identity that says, oh, there are things that are not talked about that are unseen, but are nonetheless powerful realities. And, you know, I'm really grateful for that. And I still wrestle every day with what that means. I and work within the Vietnamese cultural community, which is that's sort of a taboo theme there within Vietnamese culture, but uh, also within the specific Buddhist context that I'm in, it can be difficult. So I don't have this all figured out. I don't know that any of us do, but uh, it's a process that yields unique potentials. And I think that's what I'm excited to learn more about as we have this conversation and hear more about and continue plumbing in my own life. So thanks for the time. Thank you so much. Our fourth panelist is Tahil Sharma, pronouns he, his, and hit him, sorry. Tahil is the Regional Coordinator for North America for the United Religions Initiative. He was born in Southern California to a Hindu father and a Sikh mother. He believes that interfaith cooperation is impossible without embracing one's full identity in such spaces, including his own bisexual identity. Thank you so much, Geneva, and thanks to all of the previous um, panelists for actually giving me a sense of confidence as I actually am addressing this intersectional identity I, it, on my own for the first time in such a big space. So I think I have a lot of gratefulness and nervousness for that. Um, and I want to start off by saying that I was definitely born at the center of many intersections. I was born as a Hindu and a Sikh. I was born as an Indian American, and probably as a later discovery, I was born being bisexual. And that came with a lot of confusion. I will not lie to anyone on this call about that, because it was a lot of concern overlapped with curiosity and skepticism that made me think about, is it possible for me to be all of these things? I actually learned over time that it was possible. And it actually happened because of the activism work that I do in the interfaith movement. Um, when I was told at a younger age that it was impossible for me to adhere to two different traditions in the same household, when I knew that was an, a reality that I embraced, 
I knew that there was something wrong with someone's understanding of that. When people live within this constant idea that there are singular journeys and single ways of living and understanding the world, they don't actually understand the expanse at which the human experience works. And for me, it was actually challenging that status quo and saying, as much as I need to open my eyes to this larger reality, so do many others. And it starts with actually kicking down these walls that say they need to be built up and things are the way that they are. So it actually started off with me acknowledging that I came from a dual religious household and that I hear, adhere to my Hindu and Sikh realities as much as I do anything else. I struggled for quite some time when that came to the balance of my religiosity and spirituality with my bisexual identity, something that I was concerned about not because my family actually wasn't accepting because they've been very accepting of many others since I could remember. They taught me the ideas of accept ac acceptance and compassion and love. And I just was never comfortable of being able to embrace that with them until actually July of this year. And it meant a lot for me to understand that it's not just about the approach to how people and institutions have created this idea that you are not accepted with your religious identity while being something else that might seem not accurate or not connected whatsoever. The fact of the matter is, is religiosity and the institution of religion are newer constructs in comparison to LGBTQ identity. And that's just a fact of the human experience. What we have to keep reminding people is that our ability to love others, our ability to accept our entire selves is the highest priority and that institutions will never dictate that for you. And that took me a lot of, that gave me a lot of, a lot to think about when I was trying to see how my identities would react to me and my bisexual identity. When I look towards Hinduism, a religion that's seen as being over 5,000 years old, the fact of the matter is being LGBTQ was equally a part of the Hindu experience more than I had ever been taught at home because I lived in a cis heteronormative reality that was filled with patriarchy. And I was told that it was not okay to be homosexual. It was not okay to be anything but straight. When in reality, we have gods and goddesses that are dedicated to the LGBTQ community as patron deities. Why was I never taught this when I was growing up with my Hinduism? And in Sikhism, that actually does not address scripturally anything about spirituality. There's an important line that I've gotten from a Muslim saint who is a contributor to the Guru Granth Sahib, the Sikh scriptures that says, Ek manti anek bhatkar saji sajanhare, that we as, as vessels of the divine spirit are like clay and that God is the potter. There is nothing wrong with the clay and there's nothing wrong with the potter. And there's so much value to understanding that we're all shaped as these unique vessels. If I was taught at an earlier age that I'm this unique vessel that can hold a divine spirit like God that is unnameable, that is un unimaginable, that is infinite, and that I could still be the whole person that I am entering any space that I want to, I would have not struggled the way that I did. Millions of us wouldn't have, anyone on this call wouldn't have. But the fact of the matter is, is it took me through these struggles, through this understanding, through challenging the status quo, and this is an invitation to everyone that's on this call. You are equally a part of the, the deconstruction and the reformation of what religion and spirituality looks like now. However you adhere to being religious, spiritual, or secular, you are a part of a growing movement that says religion and spirituality have never been the same since the beginning, and you're a part of the we will never learn to know what it means to actually be our full selves. And I continue to ask this with full skepticism towards my religions. When I look at systems like the caste system that comes from Hinduism, I know to challenge it at the very core of how it exists 
because it is an oppressive system. That oppression exists in volumes when you adhere to other identities that also have been a part of an oppressive legacy that understand oppression more in depth. So if you're an LGBTQ person and you're a part of the caste system, you're definitely more screwed in comparison to others. And when I look at it through the Sikh lens, a, a lens that's always taught me that I must serve everyone like I serve the divine, yet there are still heteronormative practices that allow men to still take rule and take dictate the way that things function, that I must go out of my way to make sure that women and others and trans people and others who are not usually represented take the helm of leadership like others should. At the end of the day, this is a part of our work. I have to understand that in depth, knowing that not everyone is going to agree with me. People from my own tradition are going to probably look at this call and keel over because I'm saying these things. My parents had a struggle being as accepting as they are to hear that I was bisexual earlier this year. I know that because this is something happening to their own. And there are three uncomfortable things that Indian parents don't like to talk about. Sexuality, mental health, and if you've eaten before you've left the house or not. Those are three very central things. Um, and it continues to be a struggle. There's no easy way around this because they don't see this as normal. But the fact of the, pa fact of the matter is, is we are a part of a normal. We are a part of a greater good. And we are a part of something powerful that no one can change except ourselves. So I have this invitation to all of us to keep remembering that we have, there's a struggle internally and externally to how these intersection, intersecting identities will work, but we have to make sense of it to ourselves first and embrace it because that'll be a part of the change that we're seeking in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much to heal. So our final panelist uh, needs no introduction. Uh, Dominique is the founder of Start the Wave, an inclusive nonprofit organization focused on empowering and supporting grassroots initiatives worldwide. She is also an artist best known for her role in sci-fi's TV show, Winona Earp, where she plays a bisexual young woman coming into her sexuality and power. Despite having grown up in an atheist household, Dominique now identifies as spiritual and open-minded having found great relief, strength, and clarity in surrendering to a higher power. She feels that her spiritual awakening has been a great bomb in her journey of self-acceptance, leading her to come out as her queer authentic self earlier this year. Hmm. Thank you, Geneva. My goodness, what inspiring human beings. This has been um, absolutely magic hearing everybody's story. So thank you for sharing. Um, for me, I was brought up in an atheist household. We didn't have any faith. There was not really much talk of faith at all in my childhood. And I just thought that was, you know, I didn't really have many feelings around it until um, uh, later on in, um, as I started to get older, as, as a highly sensitive individual, um, I found that the more I learned about the injustices in the world and the pain and suffering, the more it like weighed down on me like really heavily. And I found that not having any faith, um, yeah, how it showed up in me, I suppose, was just like this sense of this weight. This weight is the only way that I can, can describe it of like knowing that I wanted to do good in the world, but not knowing how because it just felt like there was so many problems and so many issues and I didn't really know where to put my focus um, and so this led to my mental health being um, really suffering and it got to the point where I, I felt very unwell and I needed to find something to try and help my mentality, um, the way that I saw the world and to try and find the beauty in the world because it just all seemed so dark. Um, and so I, you know, uh, on my journey, I met um, a beautiful woman. In fact, I was really drawn to her energy. I'm somebody who's always felt energy uh, uh, and experienced um, 
I felt, I felt like I've experienced energy, if that makes any, any sense. And so I was drawn to this woman uh, who informed me that they'd just come from a 10 day Vipassana meditation um, course. And she said, it's funny that you're drawn to me right now. I've just come back from Vipassana and I didn't know anything about that. But um, after having a, a very brief conversation, I was really interested in, in meditation and diving into meditation. And so it took me a year to actually have the courage to sign up to 10 days of silence and being uh, alone with my own <laughs> my own thoughts and my own mind but um, it got to a point where I just knew that I had to do something and this just felt like it had organically come on my path and that it might be an avenue to explore so uh, I was heading off to go traveling and I decided to go out of my way to a little place in Cambodia and do a 10 day Vipassana retreat in Cambodia. And what happened in that retreat is, it's very, very hard to put into words, but it felt like my entire being was cracked open and a light shone down and throughout my entire vessel. And really that was um, the beginning of my spiritual awakening. And it was almost like, the way I describe it is that it was as if I was handed a key to my own happiness in, in that meditation retreat, and but I had to take it and I had to go and open the door. So it was like being gifted a taste at maybe something else, um, a different way of thinking and a different way of being that, that was um, incredibly addictive I was like I want some more of that that feels that feels really good and that feels uh, like a, the, that lightness um, and the weight started to lift the clouds started to part in my in my brain and I just started to see things a lot more clearly and so what has happened since then over the past three years because that was in 2017 has been just um, an unfolding I suppose of uh, you know, really seeing and experiencing the interconnectedness of, of all things um, and surrendering, surrendering and letting go and releasing the ego and control. And, and, and so as I have been really diving into these practices of meditation and various different forms of meditation since then to try and find my own path with it, my own path of spirituality and how I connect to the divine um, through various different practices, it has given me a sense of faith, right? Faith for the future, faith and hope, uh, which has been, you know, absolute saving grace. Like I, I, it's it has helped me come out of, uh, you know, very in a very negative headspace, and and really was a big part of the reason that start the wave was was born because I had I suddenly had hope again I was like okay there's what can I do this is something that I can do and uh, you know start the way very much being founded on um, embracing evolution and the law of impermanence and just like being open-minded to all things and the infinite as we talk about like just that we may put use different words and different ways to explain it but really like just the infinite nature of this human experience that we all have and when I started living that and realizing that actually I was just a spiritual being having a human experience then um yeah, it released a lot of things in me. Um, now, where my sexuality intersects with this story, <laughs> we're getting there, um, <laughs> is that um, I I knew <laughs> I've known that I was queer since uh, since I was nine years old. Um, I had some experiences that um, I definitely confirmed to me that I very much liked uh, uh, both male and female um and now all, all genders inclusive um it and i and i had experiences with 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 um a girl and but then um after that i had some pretty negative experiences that shut me down so some uh moments with uh friends and and uh that that proved sort of taught me that it was wrong that it was wrong that this is not something that we should be doing or exploring and my um i had i put a lot of importance on fitting in and i guess 
the way that uh, when I was reflecting on how my sort of atheist upbringing intersects with this, um, I was really taught that like I could be whoever I wanted to be. And so I think that extended really to my sexuality and the way that I saw my sexuality. I was like, I can control whoever I want to be. Really, all I have going on is me and my my surroundings. Like I didn't have any sort of, I had a, found difficulty or an inability to zoom out. Like there was, that wasn't taught to me. So it was very much like the focus on me, my experiences around me and, and those that are, that are closely affected by that. So I was just trying to fit into whatever everybody else was maybe t teaching me to be or, to, or, or um, reflecting that I, that I should be. Um, and so I just decided to suppress that side of myself and focus on, you know, the fact that I was attracted to men and, and that that was e the easier route to go. Um, but since my spiritual awakening, I think what I, the journey that I've been on is really coming home to the fact that actually, as Tahil said, like, it, I've been getting to know who I am now on a soul level. Like I'm, I'm realizing that instead of being controlling and being some, whoever I want to be, actually my journey through spirituality is, is, is coming home to and, and learning who I am at a soul level and that I have been put on this earth as I am and that much of my journey is to, into, you know, to um, find and love all those in, unintegrated parts of myself. Um, and celebrate them and free myself from from that suppression um, and realize that you know have faith I suppose that I am exactly as I'm supposed to be um, yeah I think that's that's about it <laughs> thank you so much and thank you to all of the panelists for sharing your stories and for being so vulnerable with everyone. I know it's it's very meaningful to me and I'm sure to our audience as well. Um, so Priyana has been uh, monitoring the chat for, for questions. And I think uh, maybe we'll open with a, a group question. There were two that really stood out um, and they may not apply they may not both apply to every panelist. So perhaps if you want to just pick the one that speaks the most to you. Um, so the first question is, if your family's values and faith did not connect with your own, how did you navigate coming to terms with that difference of opinion? And do you have any advice for people who are going through the same? And then the second question, if this maybe more applies to you, is how do you mentally grapple with the idea that there are liminal spaces for gender and section, gender and sexuality present and reconcile that with maybe gender specific religious ritual practices such as the bat mitzvah? So I'm gonna, who would like to start? To you? <laughs> or, okay. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I don't know. The unmute button was just not cooperative. Um, both really important questions. Um, in terms of the first one about my family's values and faith, um, I know for a fact that much of my family was coming from a conservative interpretation of Hinduism that, you know, in its own ways was actually espousing um, misogyny and chauvinism as a ploy to just say, well, men are better because God made us better. And me being the act, the person that actually was like, nope, that's not how that works. I'm actually, uh, I actually adhere to what is known as Shaktiism, which is this idea that the feminine divine is what really it exists in, as energy in all things. And that means, you know, when there are ways that you don't know how to find a, um, an agreement or a consensus with your family about their values and traditions, this is where you have to create your own space. You're not there to concede that you have to agree with your humanity and your identity and become a part of a mold because your values and your existence are not to be compromised. It's about making sure that in the previous point that I made about being a part of this change of religion and spirituality, that you begin to etch your own and create your own traditions that are continuations of those from the past. Um, for the sake of conversation around gender and sexuality as a point, 
Um, Hindus and Sikhs don't you have this idea that you know two men and two women can get married as a part of the tradition, but there are now Hindu priests and priestesses who are actually hosting same-sex marriages. That is a direct challenge to tradition, quote unquote, and it's actually an extension of tradition. That is the point. What is not made for you, you make for yourself. Don't let anyone think you can't, because that is exactly how these traditions work. They're an extension of ourselves and our legacies, which are about rebellion, which are about accepting our whole selves, and which is most importantly about connecting with the divine. And no one is exempt from being connected to the divine. And that's the point we're trying to make. Thank you, Tihil. Does someone else want to jump in? I'd love to follow up just on that, because I have a, just a little bit of a comment that relates very much to what you were saying. You know, I think it's important as we grapple with these questions to do some formal education or inquiry into religion as well. Um, you know, there's, I joke sometimes about Buddhism, for instance, we say, oh, Christianity is schismatic and, and so splintered in Western culture. Well, we've had 500 more years to do that. And Hinduism has had, you know, several hundred years, thousand years more than that. So uh, when we think of something as being orthodox, it's important to remember that orthodoxy is an agreed upon reality over a period of time. And so much of what we consider orthodox in many religious traditions, including the Buddhist tradition, is really, in fact, heterodox when you look at it through the lens of a, of a classical uh, historical examination of reality. So these are ideas that people have that often diverge from the charismatic founders of a religious school of thought, and they embody it in a particular way, and that's fine. And I think we can utilize that same sort of authority as, as religious practitioners and especially as religious leaders today to make changes where they're required based on our understanding of reality and scientific observation of, of you know, biology and physiology. That's all well and good, but we should also be careful. You know, for instance, I was made a, a patriarch in our tradition in 2015 and promptly changed the title to ancestor. It's a better translation and it's inclusive because one of the changes that I was able to make was to stop dividing men and women. You know, historically in our tradition, women have to sit junior to men forever. No matter if it's the most junior male, the females, the nuns always sit junior to the men, no matter if they're the oldest, most senior in the world. I just stopped doing it. But it wasn't just a flippant change. And I think that's important. Religion has some staying power. And if we want our changes to be meaningful, we need to be in conversation with orthodoxy, with heterodoxy, and with the, the history that's actually present within our tradition so that we can make it in accord uh, with the, the foundational principles of a tradition that allow it to stay and be meaningful into the future. Uh, Dom and Porter, you guys want to jump in? <laughs> Uh, I, was, I was going to say, uh, Slats can go first. I, I can uh, jump in real quick. Um, so I think, and, and this is something that I do very frequently. I have very um, frequent conversations with friends and, and family about religion and values that differ, um, especially with my own immediate family. Um, and I think one thing that we need to remember is that a person, and you, you can hear it expressed here by all of us, a person's religious or spiritual identity is extremely meaningful to them. So when you approach those conversations, um, I think it needs to be coming from a place of loving and, and kindness and openness and no judgment because those conversations are so delicate. Um, and I think that a lot of presumptions are, are, are made a lot of, uh, or assumptions, I apologize. Um, and I think that a lot of people go into those conversations thinking about what they're going to say, but they're not thinking about listening and hearing for points of connection with that other person. Um, so for instance, when when I speak with my my mom who, who uh, converted to the Catholicism actually um, just a few years ago, um, she, she speaks to me about her prayer and I speak to her about my meditation. And we try to find how those two things make us feel and how, how they, they aren't that far off. Um, and and I, I think that I accept what she says so openly and I'm so happy for her that she has found a faith that she believes in and that brings her so much joy that I love that. It brings me so much joy to know that. 
And, um, I think that she's gotten, she's, she's been more accepting with me knowing that I may not believe in that religion specifically, but I do believe that we are all celebrating the same thing and that we are all doing it differently and we should celebrate that. Um, I created recently with one of our rooms, we call it the Zen Den, but it's, um, it's basically just a, a good space for, for prayer and meditation. And, um, in going through that, I actually thought of all the people in my life and ended up getting their, um, books, their religious texts that, that they, um, like to read and, and like to go through. And I do intend to read all of them, but also just so that they're there so that when they're staying or if they're even just popping by for dinner, but they have a prayer that they're supposed to do, they can pop up to the Zen den and celebrate them. Like it, it should be so open and inclusive. And I think maybe just enter those, those conversations from, from an open space. Uh, this is speaking a little bit more towards the the second question about uh, holding space for uh, liminality in the midst of hypergendered traditions. Um, in in Christian practice, we have something called confession, and I say that knowing that there are, uh, there are a lot of people with Catholic backgrounds um, on this on this particular call. Um, in in how it's practiced in in my denomination. Uh, it is a corporate confession that we, it's a prayer that we say together every week when we gather for worship. Um, and the point of that time is not actually to make you feel terrible about yourself, which is how it's often portrayed and how it often is done in, uh, in a lot of traditions, but actually to acknowledge that we don't always get things right. And when we are honest about how we don't get things right, and we are able to bring that up before God, then we are more likely to be able to change our behavior and do it better. And I think that, you know, for all of us, there are things that we, that we are, that we get right. And there are things that we get wrong. And in the traditions, there are practices that come up because the culture at the time thought this, and now we're learning something else. And so we can look at those traditions and confess, wow, something was missed here. And now we're going to revise in the spirit of that tradition. So I know, I know, um, B'nai mitzvahs, which is a gender neutral term, um, uh, have started to happen. Um, I've been, we, we have few hyper gendered rituals in Christianity, but we have a lot kind of culturally in Christianity. So you'll find a lot of church that have men's groups and women's groups, and that's their adult social programming. Um, and so trying to examine those traditions that really come from how we have played out our tradition in specific cultures and realizing that it's okay to adjust those based on, based on what we know now and actually get back to a, a, more, a more authentic practice. Thank you all for your responses. Um, so now I'm gonna give each of you an individual question uh, that was put into the chat. So um, the first question will be for Slats. I'll just go in the order that you guys spoke. Um, did you ever think about leaving church and the religion behind after being unaccepted in the beginning? This is a great question. Um, yes and no. So I, I struggled a lot, particularly in kind of middle school and high school, when I was in the midst of a lot of the um, anti-queer messaging, um, li still living in the South and still being around this all the time, starting to be involved in conversations in my particular denomination about what does it look like if we allow gay people to get married or ordained or, you know, serve in these leadership roles, um, which weighed a lot on me. and. I think it was a combination of that as well as just growing up, getting older, having been raised with the tradition and being at the age where it was healthy for me to question that, that I actually considered myself agnostic for the majority of high school. Um, now, because my parents both worked in the church, I, I was at church all the time. I was constantly participating in things. There was really no other option. So um, in that time, I kind of developed two two selves. So one that said, you know, I'm agnostic because you can't prove or disprove the existence of God. And this is what makes sense. And then the other part of me that said, well, if I believed in God, here are the things that I would believe about God. And uh, at the end of that, at, 
in the end of that time, which is when a pastor was, um, who had been really influential for me was actually leaving our church and going to, going to a new position. And she'd been really keeping that faith part of me alive that I realized that I was going to have to make a choice. And I realized that I was actually happier when I was putting faith in something than when I was not. I also had several experiences um, that had nothing to do with emotions, but just practicality. Like when I started undergrad, I was in theater school and theater school is notoriously busy. And I was not going to church because I had no time to go to church. And I, I missed that. And I felt, I felt this ache. So I knew that if I were to leave, it would be enormously difficult. Um, And now I, I say that I stay because I'm actually, I need that specific kind of practice. I need that practice in community. I am a worship nerd. I love liturgy. I love hymns. Uh, I love gathering together and, and singing. I'm, I'm struggling now a bit because of the pandemic. I haven't been into church in person since March. Um, and that is what I need because I'm, I'm not actually able for myself to do that on my own. Um, I do, I am kind of constantly in the process of figuring out how I interact with the church as a queer person, particularly in leadership. So I've um, gone to seminary. I worked leading a church for three years. I am still not ordained. Um, And that is largely because I am, I, I am not sure if I have the energy all the time to be ordained in a church that is primarily straight and cisgender and have to do that kind of that kind of work of educating everyone, um, particularly at like my own job with, if I got ordained, it would be my job. And that just seems exhausting. So at this point I kind of stay a little bit outside. I write, I resource, I talk. Um, uh, but I'm kind of constantly examining what my relationship should be. And I also think it's important to say that, that my experience is my experience. And that is not going to be true of, of everyone um, who is raised queer and Christian, um, that the the experiences of that are going to be unique to every person and how every person finds healing from that experience is going to look different. I believe that there are churches out there. Um, I know that there are churches out there because I've worked with them and I've been to them and I've celebrated with them who will unabashedly welcome in queer people and do what they can to heal that hurt. And also that might not be the path for everyone. Thank you so much. So the next question will be for Porter. Uh, Do you think one day that churches and the LGBTQIA 2S plus community will find a balance to understand each other without judgment? Um. Oh, I mean, that's a, that's a good one. I guess uh, it would be hard for me to know or, or say. I think we're moving the ball forward. Um, I think that we're getting closer. And I think, um, or rather, I hope that in more and more areas and more and more religions, more and more churches, um, more folks that are part of, of the community do feel acceptance and, and do feel that they can... Um, be their true selves and and still be part of that religious community um, in in really a a more wholesome manner um, and not have to hide who they are. Um, I do think we're getting closer though. I mean, even with the Pope coming out and saying, you you know, we need to love people regardless of of their background. I, I hope that that narrative continues, but then even we're not saying we need to love them even if, but just that it is accepted. It is wholly accepted and they are, everybody is, is connected and we are all brothers and sisters and we all love one another um, and, and should be there for one another and no human is better than the next. And um, I think that we're getting there. I think it's, it's especially interesting because I know that um, the younger generations get a lot of flack uh, that we, we are constantly known as, you know, lazy and like we don't, you know, we don't um, believe in the traditional values of, of what we all uh, grew up in, but I think it's amazing. I think the younger generations are, are opening the, the ceiling and saying like, no, there's so much more than this. We don't need to be doing all of the things that our parents and our grandparents and our grandparents' parents did 
we need to open conversations and we need to celebrate new things and we need to accept everybody. Um, so yeah, I guess overall to answer the question, I, I, I don't know when it'll happen, but I think we're moving the ball forward and, and that's a positive thing. Thank you. So the next question will be for Josh. Do you think psychological spiritualism and homosexuality have a connection? Yes, uh, but I want to break that down a little bit. I, I would break this down into psychology, spirituality, and, and uh, sexual orientation. You know, some of the more, I think, I would say in touch psychologists and mental health professionals out there are keen to understand that psychology has long suffered from what we call physics envy. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could just have a hard observational science that would allow us to say, this is why this happens and this is exactly it, but alas, we don't. Uh, when we look at the field of spirituality and the intersection of science, especially in Western religion, historically, and where the church has regarded scientists with concepts that we take for granted today, spirituality at large has often struggled from physics envy as well. Well, we've got these suppositions, but wouldn't it be nice if there were some observational way to say this is exactly it and this is why this is the only true path and you should do that. Um, and then we look at sexual orientation. And I think those of us that have this lived experience understand that it's somewhat fluid, but there's a deeply phys uh, physiological component and there's a large psychological component. But wouldn't it be nice if we could just look at the legislation and the naysayers and say, this is exactly where it is on the genome and this is why it happens and et cetera. So, you know, we look at these fields as sort of being oppositional. There's secular hard science and then there's spirituality that's the opposite. And then maybe there's gender identity and sexual orientation that float in this other multimodal or bimodal realm. And in fact, all of these things are just grasping at straws based on what we can observe and experience and, and what we can know to be true in our hearts and trying to bridge them consistently. So I don't know if that's an adequate answer for what you were looking for, but I think that none of these suppositions are farther apart uh, than just that. They all share this physics envy that's problematic, but also kind of exciting. So hopefully we get closer to understanding things as time goes on. Thank you so much. So the next question will be for Tahil. Um, are you familiar or aware of Ramakrishna Paramahashna and Swami Vivekananda? I do believe in their views, but I am struggling to find a place as a gay person uh, going hand in hand with Hinduism. That's a very real feeling. And that's a feeling that I had when I began to question many parts of my identity, including my faith and sexuality. Um, wherever there are points where we don't feel things go hand in hand, that's when you have to know you need to dig deeper. Because there's a lot of what we consider sort of the super official norms and realities that we create around traditions because we don't actually go back far enough to see what they tell us. And this was a point that Joshua, you were making before as well. In this idea that we're studying about religion and spirituality, it's much more in depth than the past century. It's much more in depth than the past millennia. It's much more than the common era, which is the past 2000 years or so. The point is, it's not just about, you know, trying to see things go hand in hand. If things don't go hand in hand, nothing is held against you to find a better place for yourself. That is the bare minimum of what you deserve. But the thing about religion and spirituality is it's also not a monolith. Uh, the two um, people that you talked about, Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekanand, are a part of the Vedanta school of philosophy. The Vedanta school is more modern, it is more accepting in some ways, and it's still very rigid in a lot of ways, which means it's just one school in this giant school of understanding of Hinduism. It doesn't end with the Vedanta society being the, the latest and greatest denomination that we have. We're still developing schools of philosophy. We're still developing ideas of what it means to be a part of tradition and what it means to be a part of new movements for justice. Hinduism has a lot of work to it. That's why it's not as easy to say it's just a polytheistic religion that's from India. It's way more complicated than that. When you tell people that there are 330 million gods, but we still believe in one God, 
you thought the Trinity was confusing. Imagine trying to get 330 million deities together and make it into one thing. And the example that I use is like taking a spoon of sugar, acknowledging all the individual crystals and then mixing it into a glass of water. It's just as sweet to realize that all of those crystals make that one identity, that one entity possible. It's that kind of imagination. It's that kind of interpretation and relationship that you also have the responsibility to build and discover for yourself and potentially for other people to understand it's actually possible. And Porter, there were actually two things that I kind of wanted, I reflected on and want to kind of respond to as well in this uh, answer. Um, one is I, I often hear that um, it should be that we do things regardless of what makes people different. And I always invite the opposite response. And I say, I, you should actually do it in full regard as to where people come from and why they're different. Because I think what we really struggle from oftentimes is this idea that, oh, it doesn't matter where you come from as long as you're a good person. Actually, it should be the complete opposite. I wanna know how in the world you came from a different world, a different reality, yet we still came to the same conviction of loving one another. That we still came to the same conviction that we have justice striving for one another. It really involves us being millennials, being the people that are not, that are trendsetters in a negative connotation and not a positive connotation, that actually that this is an invitation for that intersectional justice to take place by being very intentional about how and why we learn about each other. And more importantly, the other point that I wanted to address is that like, we're not the ones to push away from tradition. This conversation that we're having, granted it's on Zoom, granted it's being live on YouTube and it's too modern for a lot of old farts to really like grasp onto, it's fine. The point actually is, this is tradition. This is legacy. We are doing some really solid work right now that is being viewed by over almost 600 people. And this is a part of what will make a difference. If there are churches that collapse because they're not being radically inclusive, it's not on the people, it's on the church. At the end of the day, if they're not willing to say that our love, that God associated love that we create is not going to accept the whole person that's going to come into our doors, that church deserves to collapse. So does that mosque, so does that synagogue, so does that temple, because they are not actually acknowledging that they're putting a limit. They have the audacity to put the limit on God's love. That's the point. That's what we're challenging. And that's how we go forward from here. Thank you so much. So Dominique, um, so there's sort of, there's a lot of questions for you. We'll say, <laughs> so I'm gonna try to narrow it down. Um, so first, uh, would you say that meditation saved you? And also, um, how do you stay focused on your journey and truth when you spend so much time uplifting other people's stories and their journey? Hmm. Um, I'm not sure that I would use the phrase that it saved me, but that, but it certainly helped me a lot. Um, there's no doubt about that, and it changed the course of my future. Like it changed my path completely. It helped me to separate myself from the thoughts that were in my head, which then allowed me to access my gut and understand the difference between the truths that were coming through from a place um, a deeper place and and that once I allowed myself to listen to that um, it guided me uh, into where I am now into places that I am I'm very very grateful uh, to to be um, and yeah, so it, it's been it's been incredibly transformative, and and what the you know the the path that unfolded since meditation has been like none other but than magical is the way that I can describe it. Like it's uh, the synchronicities and the you know um, 
the representation of the interconnectedness of all things has been so apparent that I had no choice really but to surrender to a higher power just when I was doubting it there would be something that was gifted to me by the universe that then led me on to further deepening my understanding so what you know meditation definitely being the the thing that that kick-started that started me off on that journey but that many things have come along my path since then to deepen my connection to all that is the great mystery of life and and the divine um so yes and what was the second question Geneva sorry <laughs> Um, how do you stay focused on your own journey and your own truth when you're you spend so much time uplifting other people's stories? Sure. Um, I think that they inform each other. So um, it's definitely been um, a journey of like really uh, getting clear about my needs and my spiritual needs and what that looks like and being um, allowing myself to put those things put those things as a priority in my life so um working out what that looks like whether it be that you know I wake up and and um you know start the start the day with yoga and meditation and prayer and gratitude practice or whatever those things look like and allowing myself to and trying to shift my mindset and not see that as um something that that is um selfish in any way to take that time for myself but rather that in order to uplift other people and to to truly love from the right place I need to fill up my cup first uh, so that it seeps over into the universe and 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 creates that light and that's been a, that's been a real journey that's been very very hard for, for me personally I came from um a very very uh, um a background that taught me that uh the most productive the, the most important thing is productivity and that we should constantly be do, you know, being productive and, and not taking that time for ourselves. So within my, within my journey, it's very much been a, um, a deepening into self-love and realizing what that looks like for me and how those practices can um, inform, inform, um, yeah, that, that, that sense of, of worth and, and, and self-love. So um, but then also, I would I would also say that by having conversations like this, by doing this work, it it has tremendous value in my own life. So I'm constantly learning by doing the work that I'm doing. So it's really just a gift, and it it's, it's it doesn't feel like work. It feels just like what as if I get to be a part of this, and and so um, yeah, just immensely grateful to all of those things. Thank you so much. Um, I definitely echo that. And I, on that note, we are about out of time. Um, so I want to just thank all of the panelists for being here today and everyone who is watching this on YouTube. Thank you so much for your time on behalf of the Interface Center, Start the Wave and uh, URI North America. Just thank you for attending. I hope you've found this program meaningful and that it encourages you to embrace your whole self in your own life. Um, and if you'd like more information about any of the organizations that participated, um, I have put all of the links in the description on the, the live video. Um, so thank you all and, and have a, a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Geneva. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.